Happy Friday. It's Patricia Murphy. This is Seattle Now. The story had a different ending this week as a jury found former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin guilty. Here in Seattle, the weather is taking a turn and takeout booze is sticking around. Seattle Times food writer Ton Vin is here along with Phyllis Fletcher to break it all down. But first, let's get you caught up. Fake summer is over. The clouds and rain are coming back. And the spike in COVID cases we've been hoping to avoid is here. This is the beginning of a fourth wave. And we are starting, unfortunately, at a higher level than the other waves have started from. That's bad. Governor Inslee said Thursday that we're seeing increasing cases and hospitalizations thanks to more contagious variants that are now responsible for more than half of the new cases. Inslee says infections among young people are driving this latest surge, and the focus is on getting them vaccinated. Meanwhile, King County public health officials are warning the public to avoid what they're calling unusual COVID testing sites around Seattle. The pop-up sites have been seen at Green Lake Park, Gasworks Park, and in Ballard and Capitol Hill. Public Health says the company running them hasn't reported any positive test results after several weeks in business. They've also observed staff without appropriate PPE. If you or someone you know has already been tested at one of these sites, officials say the results might not be accurate and you should probably get retested. And a shot at a national championship won't happen for the UW women's volleyball team. They made it all the way to this year's NCAA Final Four, but lost last night to Kentucky. Still, Pac-12 champs this year. First title since 2016. Congratulations, Huskies, on a great season. It's finally Friday. The sunsets have been spectacular this week, and the weather has been perfect for strolling. A lot of people were getting out in their phase three form, and let me tell you, man, businesses were ready. I even noticed my neighborhood walk-up booze window has switched from hot cocktails to cold. Phyllis Fletcher is here. She's an author and editor. Phyllis, have you made the seasonal switch from hot beverages to iced? (laughs) I have. I have. I have. Absolutely. I, I had a um, iced Americano just yesterday and I enjoyed it very much. Sweet, sweet. <laughs> and Ton Vin is here, too. He's a food and drink writer for The Seattle Times. Hey, Ton. Hi, Trish. Are you swapping out your hot toddies for margaritas? Oh, I never drink the hot cocktail. Always a cold one, even dead of winter. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. Well, in more sobering news, it was a historic week in the verdict of the trial for Derek Chauvin. Chauvin was found guilty of all three charges, second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder and second degree manslaughter. It is rare for a police officer to be indicted for killing someone on duty. It's also even more rare that they are convicted. Tan, I was watching this live this week and I was holding my breath. I was holding my breath. It's, it's funny, right? Because the verdict came back so soon and that's always a clear sign. It's a guilty verdict. And yet we still, we were still in suspense. And it just shows our distrust of the system. You know, when the verdict was read, I remember just like when I said, oh, justice is served and so forth. But hours later, when I was on Capitol Hill, the police were on one side of Broadway Street patrolling, making sure things were okay. And another side was just Capitol Hill drillers just yelling at the police, recording their every move because they didn't trust them, wearing masks, not because of COVID, but because they didn't want to be identified by police. I mean, it just drove home that the racial tension, the class tension, it's still there. That didn't go away with one verdict, sadly. Phyllis, what do you think? Being in the business that we're in, we're exposed repeatedly to, you know, the kind of by proxy to the trauma of these things. And so I I found myself, you know, having kind of the luxury to not have to watch it up close. So I availed myself of that. And I yeah. like, so my way of dealing with it was I reloaded the New York Times live page about it um, so that I could kind of get it in pieces without having to actually watch it unfold. And I'm I'm glad I was able to do that. And I did kind of have that, like, I remember that kind of tension in my chest And then, you know, being able to take that breath kind of like I did just now, but then just feeling kind of numb and kind of trying to play out in my mind, like, okay, what does happen next then? And then like, well, I guess the next time someone is, is filming an officer doing something like this, their life is probably in jeopardy. Numbness feels like the, the best way I can describe my response to it. 
Yeah. Phyllis, like, when I saw this tension on Capitol Hill last night, just between the police and the protests and so forth, I was so happy when the light turned green, I could just drove past it. Because I wanted to be naive. I wanted to know that, hey, that verdict meant something, and all the racial tension went away and the police tension went away, even though it didn't. I just didn't want to think about that. You know, the verdict does mean something, but what it means and where do we go from here really remains to be seen. All right. Seattle is still in phase three for now, you guys. The mask mandate in effect. And I personally have been very good about this. I just wear my mask. Lately, though, I've been feeling a lot more conspicuous in my mask when I'm outdoors because more and more I am noticing people are not wearing theirs. So I feel weird. I feel weird. And there's science behind it, right? Because outdoors, less transmissible. We know that. Phyllis, have you changed the way you've thought about wearing your mask? Nope. I still wear it. You know me. We (laughs) sat together for a long time. I'm a huge square. I will be wearing that mask. (laughs) And um, I have seen, you know, like some rollout of different thoughts around, you know, where and under what circumstances that they would be recommended. And I know I'm going to be one of those holdouts who's wearing it all all the way past uh, until I get like a very, very clear green light. You know, I think that that's I'm just more comfortable that way. And I do like to really base what I'm doing on, you know, public health recommendations, you know, so it's like, there's opinion pieces out there about like, we need to see the end of this pandemic, we need to have it in our sights somehow, we need the light at the end of the tunnel, we need to start getting these recommendations about unmasking now. And it just kind of reminds me of like, kids who are in the backseat of the car going, are we there yet? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the answer is no, we are not there yet. No, we're not. Yeah. And so I appreciated um, the article in the New York Times uh, that came out where they had like a very simple graphic that showed like... Is that the two out of three rule? Two out of three. Yeah. I was like, okay, I can wrap my head around this and I feel more confident about it because it is coming from epidemiology. Like I appreciate that. And, you know, infectious disease epidemiology specifically. So I'll be looking for more signals like that to know when, when it's okay to take it off. Yeah. All right. So the two out of three rule is you have to have two of these three things to take off your mask and be safe. Outdoors plus socially distance, no mask needed, right? Outdoors, no distance, mask needed indoors always need your mask that's the quick and dirty breakdown on that one ton what about you you know it's it's these things just come in wave because you're talking about the new york times story this week that's like one of five major stories on this topic the tone through all this is like hey america it might be safe to not wear a mask in public that's the (laughs) um, implied conclusion here and i encourage readers and listeners to read all these news stories because there's one point in this that people aren't getting. And that is what they're saying is there have been COVID cases outdoors. And yeah. what those yeah. cases are is face-to-face conversation and prolonged conversation. And if you remember last week when the weather in Seattle was around 80 degrees, everyone was <laughs> outdoor, not social yeah. distancing, prolonged conversation face-to-face. In Bear yep. Garden, in Gasworth Park, in Green mm-hmm. Lake, pretty much mm-hmm. hell, everywhere in Seattle. People were not so yep. missing last week. <laughs> in other news this week, the Washington State Legislature has legalized to-go cocktails through 2023. Inslee signed this on Wednesday. To-go alcoholic beverages were legalized last May, trying to help struggling businesses get through the pandemic. And I think the booze window in my neighborhood does okay. I have seen some lines. Tan, you report on restaurants and bars. What kind of difference does this make for, for businesses? Is this a big deal? Yeah. It's, the surprise is the big winner in all this. And we should back up. Uh, and the reason why the state allow for cocktails to go is because restaurants can do food to go during the pandemic. But bars can't do cocktails to go. So they figured this would help level the playing field. But the big winner so far has been Mexican restaurants and Tex-Mex. I eat out every day, pretty much, as part of my job. And I can tell you at least one out of every three Mexican restaurants I've been to, there will be mason jars or margaritas that people will order to go. You don't see that in Thai restaurants, Chinese, Italian restaurants, even American Bistro. But if you go to Mexican restaurants, they sell a lot of to-go margaritas. They've been the surprise winner in this deal. 
Ton, I have done exactly what you said, where it's like, oh, I think I want tacos tonight because I want that margarita. <laughs> and I love that. I love that I can just like, you know, um, have my husband pick it up with the rest of the order because I have learned to make one cocktail during this pandemic and it's not a margarita. I just figure I can't do as good as the restaurants that I like to get them at. And so, yeah, I'll just like be like, yeah, let's do tacos. Let me get a margarita. And I love it. I really enjoy it. I like that kind of just one comes back and I enjoy that one margarita and that's it. And, you know, when I expand it out in my mind, I'm like, I wonder if this is like, you know, if it's good for public health in other ways of like maybe reducing DWEs, like that'd be good. Um, yep. You know, so I'm digging it. I think I will be doing this for as long as it's allowed. All right. One more thing before we go. <laughs> No need to get a plan in place for your pets for the annual Blue Angels flyover because those supersonic jets won't be doing it again this year. That sound, love it or hate it, will not be part of Seafair for the second year. The Blue Angels are virtual. Phil, this is the kind of thing that people have feelings over. <laughs> they definitely do. Um, you know, it's it's one of those like kind of um, people love them, love to hate them. <laughs> Or just straight up hate it, <laughs> you know, and I'm one of those people like, uh, you know, except for college, I lived in Seattle my whole life. I did have one really cool opportunity one time to go up on a roof downtown and, and, um, you know, so then when they flew over, it was really close. Um, and that was just like interesting and cool. I, I don't think I'll be partaking in the virtual <laughs> Blue I just angels. don't that see seems... the virtual. They yeah, have the fireworks like, too. They're virtual. Like, oh uh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm good. Like, I, I would rather just do something else. So, um, <laughs> you know. And so, even though I'm, I'm not a big like seafare participant. Um, you know, I have a lot of the like seafare nostalgia of like I marched in the parades as a kid. You know, so like for especially for the kids where marching band is a big deal. I kind of hope that yeah. comes back. Um, all city. <laughs> um, yeah. You yeah, know, the, the, the kids with the parade, yeah. That. And the, the green polo shirts and the white dickies like, man, I hope they get to do their thing again. But if we got to wait another year, I'm good. I just want it to be safe. You know, Seafair is like a celebration of summer. That's what it is. And it has to be live. It only works when it's live. I mean, yeah. Trish, there are things in this world that are better off live and in person. Travel, Sounders game, and I would say Seafair. Those okay. are things that need to be live and in person. Seafair will be back next year, I'm sure. Seafair will be back next year, and that's where we're going to leave it. That's our show for this week. Thanks again to my guest, Ton Vin. He's a food and drink writer for the Seattle Times, and Phyllis Fletcher. She's an author and editor here in Seattle. Thanks, you two. Oh, thanks for having us. Thanks, Trish. Seattle Now is produced by Caroline Chamberlain Gomez, Claire McGrain, and Jason Pagano. Matt Jorgensen does our music. I'm Patricia Murphy. See you Monday.